you can do that or they don't have a call that'll do those sounds unless they're running electronics. But when I go into that gray fox distress, a lot of times we'll call in one, two, or even three fox on one stand, and we may already have a coyote or a cat laying there. I'll do that gray fox distress. If we pick up a fox, great. If we don't, whether we do or don't, the last stand that I do, I swap over and do coon distress. You know, unless I'm in a spot I don't think there's coons, I wouldn't fool with doing it. But typically, you know, there's coons everywhere. So I'm going to end that stand, and the last stand, the last sound that I'm going to do is coon distress. Time of year plays a role in how effective coon calling is, or at least it seems to in my area. Certain times of the year, you'll call one in just about every time you blow the call. And most of the time, it's going to be a big boar coon. A lot of times, he'll have his ears chewed off. They're extremely aggressive to the call. So are gray fox. They'll run in to just a few feet. A lot of times, even when you, they see you, they keep coming. And a lot of times, that allows you to kill multiple predators on one stand. You may end up on, you know, if you're in a really good spot, you may end up with a coat, fox, and a coon all in one stand. I mean, you need, you better have your buddy so you can tote the fur. But, uh, that's what I end ever stand with, and a lot of times I'll throw that. I mentioned that call does really good little cow pup distress. It's higher pitched. It's got a lot of, uh, like a little bitty puppy cow. It has some of that rasp in there where they do the, <laughs> that choppy stuff that a little cow pup will do. Or if you've ever grabbed a little bitty puppy, you know, by the nap of the neck or something, the noises they make, you can get that out of that call. And uh, that's a, uh, a couple of specialty sounds that you can do with uh, with diaphragms, and uh, I think we got a coon clip that I can show you, give you give you an example. That's that pup screamer call that I'm talking about, and this is just open hardwood timber. We made a coyote stand. That's what we went for was coyote hunting. There's not any gray fox in that area, so I didn't fool with doing gray fox, but I end the stands with coon distress, and we end up killing four coons on back-to-back -back stands that quick. And I don't know any other calls out there, mouth phone calls, that produce those sounds. And it, this coon will show you, you know, give you an idea of how aggressive they are to the calls. Stress is a new sound we figured out we could do on this call, and it's been awesome. We're pulling them in left and right. Deadly on gray fox, too. To give you an idea how that coon distress works, and like I said, that's something, if you if you want to target coons, and a lot of people go coon calling, I know there's YouTube videos out there, and you see a lot of people targeting den trees. When I first tried a little bit of, of coon calling, I thought I had to find a den tree. Thought I needed to sit up right there by that den tree and call coons out of the hole, you know, and that works. That's great. If you know where den trees are at, it's a good spot to try it. But it's not necessary. When I go coon calling, I'm typically calling some kind of other predator initially. So I'm setting up on a coyote stand or a fox stand, and coon is just uh, something extra that I'm calling. I don't look for den trees. And now if I went coon calling, I would only hit, hit den trees if I already knew where they were at. I just go to an area that had coons in it, sit down and use coon distress, and they'll come boiling in there. You don't have to wander around out there in the woods looking for den trees and putting your collar out and all that stuff. Just set up like you would for coyotes or whatever else in a spot that you can bust one and sit down and do some coon distress. But uh, and, and you know, if you want to target just coons, throw all that other stuff out the window and just do coon distress and. You know, kill you a truckload of coons if you're in a good spot. Um, the other sound that I mentioned 
that was kind of a specialty sound was that gray fox. My area, I'm from southeast Arkansas, we're wrapped up with gray fox. I, I think Texas has got a lot of gray fox. But, uh, and a gray fox probably is, is my favorite predator to call. I target coyotes a lot, but gray fox are fun. You know, they just, they're real aggressive. A lot of times you call in multiples, and once you get them up there, they're hard to run off, especially if you're using fox vocals. That's something people kept secret for a long time, and I did too until I started selling calls. Now, now it's better for me to kind of get that out there, but uh, a lot of people don't know that an animal's own voice is usually, uh, in a lot of ways, that's what he's most susceptible, vulnerable to. Gray Fox being probably the best example I know of that. Using his own voice is way better than rabbit distress or bird or anything else. There's nothing more effective on a gray fox than his voice. They can't hardly resist it. Even in, and you can call them the whole family. You know, a lot of times it'll be two or three fox in one spot. You can kill them all if you want to on one stand. And uh, I'm not sure which clip he's got up here. Go ahead and put that uh, fox clip up. Yeah, this is it. And again, we had used, this is behind coyote vocals. You'll hear, hear people say, if you're calling cats or calling for fox, don't do any coyote vocals, it's gonna run everything off. It's not true. This stand right here, we sat down to call coyotes. And you see how thick that is in there. That's typical of the stuff I hunt. Uh, so they gotta get close. They have to be convinced of what they're listening to. After we done coyote vocals, we didn't call in a cow. I swapped over to this gray fox pup, and you'll see what happens. One other thing I will mention about gray fox, and it's, uh, I said earlier, you know, your, your rhythm and your calling, just do it by feel. One thing about gray fox, they, their attention span is like that, it's real short. You gotta keep his attention, so if you're targeting gray fox and using his voice, try to keep it going. That's, uh, you know, you don't want a bunch of starting and stopping. If you stop on a gray fox, He'll leave. And you want to keep his keep his attention. That's why I'm pretty much continuous with that calling. Stop long enough to take a breath, get right back on it. Those fox know we're there. They have come all in behind us, run within a few feet of us. That's what I'm talking about, how vulnerable they are to their own voice. You know, it's be about like a human hearing a, a little kid in distress. You know, you can't you can't ignore it. Like I said, they know we're there. We just shot one of them. The other two, they don't go anywhere. They they can't resist it. So if you are calling gray fox and you shoot one, don't jump up and run out there and get him, thinking it's all over with because. There's almost always two there, and sometimes more than that. We kill a couple hundred fox in about a two month period each year using that sound. Them fox are laying about two feet apart in a line. And you see the range that he shot them at. It's just another Completely hands free, no it moving, sitting right there on the gun. It's just, you know, if you hadn't tried diaphragms, I would definitely try them. Like I said, the only drawback to them is that learning curve. But uh, I hope y'all decide to check them out. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer any here, or y'all can come see us at the MFK booth. I'll answer any of your questions, help you any way I can about getting started or anything like that. Yes, sir. It varies in different areas. Breeding, when they're breeding, in my area, 
I'll call in a big boar coon just about every time I sit down. If I make six or seven stands and I use coon on each one of them, I'll call in, out of six or seven stands, I'll call in coons on four, five, six of them. And most every time it's going to be, out of, if, let's say I kill five coons, four of them will be big boar coons. Occasionally you'll call in you know, a sow, and I have called in a sow coon with kittens before, but it, most often it's going to be a big coon. Breeding season works excellent. They respond to it year round, but I've noticed, and I'm calling them in the daytime. Uh, I got a buddy, Jason Gross Close, he calls in Virginia. I'm in Arkansas, so we're several states away. Our time frame varies a little bit. Mine in Arkansas, that November stretch into the front part of December this past year was really good. From November through December, first part of December, we were piling them up, and then it was like a switch. I mean, we'd go and, I, like I said, I was calling coats. You know, that was my target animal. But we were still running coon at the end of those stands. Well, all of a sudden, our coon numbers went from calling one in just about every time we sat down to dropping way off where we might call in one out of seven, eight stands in a day. Something I've noticed, if you can call them at night in your area or if you want to call them at night, and it is slow time, rather than running in on the call, and, and you can get them at night like that because you can see their eyes, but you just shine the trees, the ground and the trees, because you'll still have some come in, you know, hard charging on the ground like that one did, but when they get to where they're not as, as aggressive to the call, they still show interest in it, but typically what they'll do, they'll climb a tree, you know, right out there somewhere inside of you, they just don't come right in. In the daytime, it's you know you don't see them because you can't see their eyes, you know, unless you get lucky and, and see them or hear him, hear him feel him bark or something. But you just have to figure it out for your area, and then you'll have, I think, when they've got kittens or pups, I think that's another good time we have success. I don't call many coons then, but I think it's effective that time of the year, if you know, especially if you've got a bunch of coons on a place you're just trying to kill them out. That's another time of the year I'd hit them. But you can figure it out. Once you learn to do that sound, you can figure it out in your area real quick what's good for you. Because if you go out there a couple of days and you're not having much response, or if you do it at night and they're climbing a tree out there versus coming on in, you know it's kind of a down time for them. And at the same time, when you're calling and they're charging right in and seeing you and kind of acting like those fox did to where you know, again, it's using their voice. You're using coon sounds. They're extremely aggressive to it. And breeding season and stuff like that, they're going to get right on top of you. Daytime, nighttime, middle of the day. We do a lot of our coon calling, you know, right in the middle of the day. I've, where I live, there's woods right there behind the house. And if I've got downtime and just, you know, want to shoot something, a lot of times I'll go out there behind the house. we got some drains and stuff. And, I may not even fool with calling a coyote because it may be, you know, 12 or 1 o'clock. Not that you can't call a coyote in then, but I'll go out there and sit down for a few minutes and, and call coons, you know, maybe in a couple spots there, especially when they're, you know, hot or aggressive and, uh, you know, pick up some extra fur that way. But uh, just try it wherever you're at, you know, hit, hit your different times of the year. And if you already know when your coons rut and, and mate, that's when I'd hit them. That's where I'd start and, and you know, play with them a little bit and see what your wind is. And it should stay pretty consistent year to year. It may change just a little bit, about like deer rutting or anything else. You know, you'll have those those peaks at a little bit different time, but that wind should be within a few weeks. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? Or? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right, right. I would I would agree with that. I've heard a lot of people, you know, say that. I hadn't paid it, you know, a whole lot of attention to it because like I said, most of the time I'm not specifically targeting coons, you know, I'm hunting bigger predators and I'm doing the coon stuff kind of secondary just to add fur. So but I do think temperature may may factor in. I've heard a lot of guys that do a lot of coon calling say exactly what you said. I hadn't. 
Yeah, I'm glad you made that point because that's something that I didn't mention that I should have mentioned. When you're doing gray fox or coon distress, gray fox in particular, a lot of people don't know what an effective sound that is on coyotes and bobcats. Before I got into diaphragm calling and I was running electronics all the time, that's the only sound I played. I didn't play anything other than gray fox. And now that I can do it on diaphragms, I use it on every stand. But uh, the coon distress is the same way. You may sit down and set up to call coyotes and go through your, you know, your vocals and your rabbit distress and all that stuff. For one, it lengthens your, your stand out, makes it longer when you add those other animals as target animals. But you get to the end of your stand, you think, well, I ain't going to get a coyote on this one, so I'm going to jump over to coon or fox. You go into coon or fox, and all of a sudden, like you said, coyote comes running in, or a bobcat. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, you know, if you're targeting coyotes using raccoon or fox, you still, still got a chance of calling one in. They're, I guess they'll eat a squealing raccoon about like they will a squealing uh, rabbit. But uh, anybody else have any questions? Well, I appreciate y'all listening to me, and uh, hopefully you'll try them diaphragms out. Thank y'all.